unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant Tamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. One of the most enduring puzzles about the tragic second wave of COVID is how India, the world's largest vaccine producer, faces an alarming shortage of vaccines at home. A new piece by the journalist Saman Subramaniam for the online news organization Quartz argues that there's no single answer, but rather a, quote, timeline of dysfunction marked by what he calls government negligence, corporate profiteering, opaque contracting, and the inequities of the global pharmaceutical market. To unpack the story further, Samanth joins me on the phone today from London. He is a senior reporter at Quartz covering the future of capitalism. He has previously written for a variety of publications, including The Guardian, The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, and Wired. He is also the author of three fabulous books, including most recently A Dominant Character, The Radical Science and Restless Politics of J.B.S. Haldane. This was awarded one of The New York Times' 100 Notable Books of 2020. Samanth, uh, good to see you. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me on. So uh, this is obviously a very difficult time for anyone who has anything to do with India. So uh, all of us at the show hope that your family and extended circle of friends are doing okay. Uh, there is a little bit of bright news on the horizon, modest bright news. Many of the forecasting models suggest that India may have hit the peak of the second wave this week or is close to hitting the peak. Cases, of course, remain high and debts will likely increase due to the lag. I'm wondering if we could just kind of step back before we get into the question of vaccines and ask you if you could sort of provide us a snapshot of, of, of the COVID situation in India and how the government has fared in trying to address the second wave? Well, I mean, it's complicated to say in the sense that the second wave is really unlike anything we've seen in any other country uh, before this. And I was in India in December and January, uh, and it was a time when I could see over the course of those two months, uh, the country gradually opening up, coming out of the effects of the first phase of disease last year. Um, and by the end of January, by mid-February, um, you know, life was practically back to normal. People were out in restaurants. <clears throat> uh, you could go to a sporting event, a cricket match, as people did, although not at full capacity stadiums, but they were still there. Uh, travel was possible again, and people were on planes and trains uh, going across the country. Work was starting up. Life was starting up. Um, and everybody will remember Prime Minister Modi's uh, grand pronouncement at Davos um, saying that India had conquered the disease or something equivalent to that. Uh, but as we know, even as early as last November, and then again in January, and then again in February and March, there were experts warning the government that a second wave was coming. Um, they might not have warned about the ferocity of such a wave, but you know, looking around at other countries in the world, it was always possible to see that you know, one wave was followed by a second, and the second was invariably worse than the first. And so I think um, in dealing with this question of how the government has fared with the second wave, we first have to start with the fact that the government ignored all signs, all warning signals uh, of a second wave to come. And, um, and then sort of when the tide of disease rose, it seemed to quickly swamp the country's healthcare system um, even as the government was unprepared for it. I think, you know, we talk a lot about, and we have, everybody has talked a lot about the merits of lockdowns, um, you know, and opinions seem to be quite heavily divided on lockdowns as a way to control disease. But first and foremost, you know, um, everybody has to acknowledge that lockdowns are invariably there to stem, you know, the pressure on hospitals. And uh, India then went way too late uh, in the second wave without ordering lockdowns. We see lockdowns now at state levels. We still have not seen a centrally uh, announced national lockdown, which confuses the hell out of me. Um, and, uh, and I think this kind of patchwork, piecemeal lockdown system that ultimately ended up starting way too late has also prolonged and uh, prolonged and sharpened the peak of this disease uh, so that we eventually came upon these awful scenes of you know, crematoriums in Delhi and, and people outside hospitals and appeals for oxygen and drugs and hospital beds on Twitter. Um, and, you know, and this is all sort of stuff that we can see. I can only imagine uh, 
what the situation is like out there in the countryside where everything is automatically less visible. I mean, there was a report today that the authorities in Bihar have placed a net in the Ganga River uh, at the UP Bihar border because there were so many bodies of COVID dead floating in the river and they needed a way to capture them, right? So, I mean, really ghastly scenes coming from places where media penetration is fairly low. I just want to ask you a question about the lockdown because you wrote about this for Quartz uh, last month. And, you know, my simple assessment of this is uh, you had the first lockdown. It inflicted quite a lot of pain, but India came out of it saying, look, we really have dodged this COVID bullet. Uh, And Modi was able to claim the credit. Um, And now, of course, uh, this is a ferocious second wave, and it's much harder to claim credit of any kind. So when it uh, was convenient, he sort of centralized credit. And when it's not convenient, you sort of decentralize the blame. Is that a fair characterization of the kind of political calculus, do you think? I think so. I mean, uh, you know, it's um, we hear a lot more in the second wave this year about how healthcare is actually a state subject. And that state should really be, you know, taking responsibility for their healthcare systems and the, and the waves of disease in their state. Um, forgetting all the while that, you know, a national lockdown in a country where people travel across borders, um, you know, can only be ordered in Delhi by the prime minister and his government. Uh, Forgetting, for example, last year that the prime minister clearly centralized a lot of decision making in himself and his office. Um, One example is this massive fund of money that people have donated to, which is called PM Cares. Um, The fund was ostensibly set up to help with the fallout of the disease um, to help governments uh, cope. Uh, So the money is all sitting at the center, and yet the states are having now not only to declare lockdowns and to deal with their own healthcare systems, but as we will see, vie against each other to buy vaccines on the international market using their own funds once again. So it's really a question of, as you said, not just credit, but even a certain kind of power and financial decision-making ability being arrogated to the center last year. And then sort of withheld now, and the states are just sort of being left with their own devices. So you've written a series of really interesting pieces for courts, and we'll link to that on the show page on vaccines generally, but then on India's vaccine program in particular. I want to start with the latter and kind of rewind the clock to almost a year ago today, April 2020. You had scientists in Oxford, they're working on a vaccine, they negotiate an exclusive license with the pharmaceutical giant AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca, in turn, signs an agreement with companies all around the world to manufacture the vaccine. One of those companies is based in Pune and Maharashtra, the Serum Institute of India, SII. Tell us a bit about who SII is, uh, and if you could, its CEO, its somewhat enigmatic CEO, Adar Punawala. So the Serum Institute was set up about, I think, half a century ago. Um, It was set up at a time when it was both expensive and difficult to import uh, biologicals, immunologicals into India. Um, And, you know, uh, the current CEO's father, uh, the Punawala Senior, as you may call him, um, he uh, figured it was just cheaper and better to manufacture these agents in India itself. And he built this industry that started off sort of quite small, he built it into this vast vaccine and drug manufacturing behemoth. Um, Because eventually what happened, of course, as with many other industries, um, it became cheap as well as efficient to manufacture for companies to outsource their manufacturing to India. And so pharma companies around the world, but also, you know, drug aid programs, vaccine programs that are run by UNICEF and WHO, all of these entities found it cheap and efficient to go to serum uh, and to place these vast bulk orders. And serum became the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world. Um, And uh, and they've grown sort of enormously rich off this in a way that's sometimes kind of maybe a disconnect. I mean, you look at Adar Punawala's life um, with his racehorses and his fleet of Rolls Royces. And I think, I think I believe reading that, I, I remember reading that he lives in the building in Bombay that used to once be the U.S. consulate or the U.S. embassy, something of the sort. That's right. That's right. Which is, I think, one of the most expensive real estate transactions. In exactly. India. And so, you know, and his wife is a socialite who's embedded in these Bollywood circles. So there seems to be quite a disconnect between the flashiness of his life and the fact that it's built on revenue made from, you know, measles vaccines, for example. But that's fine. You know, we're not here to judge lifestyles. 
Um, but he, he's he's an odd character, and he's clearly sort of he has seen, um, uh, perhaps rightly, he has seen this uh, pandemic as a moment for serum to shine. I think like very often before 2020, if you talk to people about the Serum Institute, they wouldn't have known what the hell you're talking about. This is not sort of a household name. And I think he's seen in this both a way to enhance the profile of the company, obviously to make some money, uh, how much money is still sort of open to question, but also to kind of set Serum up for the long haul, um, both in terms of um, gaining these high profile customers and participating in this massive drive to vaccinate the world. So Serum is manufacturing AstraZeneca in India, but a few months later, it decides to manufacture vaccines for something known as COVAX, which is, I guess the best way to describe it, a kind of global initiative that takes money from rich countries to provide vaccines for poor countries. What does SII pledge to COVAX and how is it getting paid to create all these vaccines? So COVAX was set up um, by Gavi, uh, which is a sort of global vaccine alliance, um, the Gates Foundation, WHO, UNESCO, um, all of these guys sort of organized it and uh, money was pumped into it to create a fund to buy these vaccines at $3 or less. Um, so the rich countries uh, kick money in, Gavi arranges uh, the vaccine purchases at $3 or less and distributes them for free in you know 90 odd developing countries uh, so that and this is the final objective at least 20 percent of the populations in those countries are be uh, can be vaccinated for free through this big global pool of vaccines and so obviously when something like this is set up you need um, a cheap and easy and efficient way to uh, manufacture these vaccines and so it's not surprising at all i think we could have predicted this even back in april or may that all of these entities turn to the Serum Institute of India uh, to buy vaccines in bulk. It's really the only manufacturer, one of the manufacturers in the world um, that has that kind of scale going for it. Um, what the agreement is exactly between COVAX facility and uh, and Serum, we don't know. We, uh, you know, Gavi told me, uh, and this is sort of one of the few things I've been able to get out of them. Gavi told me that they always understood that. Serum would have to balance its um, obligations to the COVAX facility with the obligations to supply India itself, given that Serum is an Indian company and it's right there. Um, so I think Gavi and the rest of the COVAX cohort would assume that these are the two main priorities for Serum, which is low-cost vaccines for COVAX and then vaccines for India through whatever separate uh, arrangement they make. One question on this. Serum is manufacturing vaccines for AstraZeneca. It's manufacturing vaccines for COVAX. It also has an obligation to the country in which it's based, India, to provide vaccines for a, you know, a massive population. Does it have the capacity to deliver on each of these three objectives? Well, as we're seeing right now, no. Um, and I think the key question here, and the one to which we don't really have an answer, is has there been a huge missed window, a missed opportunity last year in which Serum and India together should have been trying to build that capacity out um, to sort of add more manufacturing lines to make sure that Serum is well stocked with all the vaccine raw material supplies that it needs? Um, you know, just simple things like that. Well, simple in retrospect, but we have to remember that the U.S. government actually did anticipate some of the stuff. So a lot of what was happening around Operation Warp Speed was essentially the government kicking money to the pharmaceutical companies saying, we think there will be a vaccine proof, and in which case we have to be ready to go at scale. So here's the money for you guys to start setting that up right away. It's the same thing the UK government did with AstraZeneca um, over here. Um, it's the same thing that Germany did with Pfizer-BioNTech for, for that vaccine. So there's been a lot of sort of government thinking in advance about uh, the things that will have to happen once the vaccine is approved. And I think in terms of capacity, um, both Serum and India have somehow just completely missed the boat in terms of building capacity up through 2020. Okay, so here's the part I don't get. If you jump ahead to October 2020, India finally places its first order for vaccines, and it's pretty small. It, it buys 11 million doses of Covishield, which is what the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine is, is marketed as in India. 
it buys another five and a half million doses of Covaxin, which is a homegrown vaccine being produced by another company, Bharat Biotech. Now, you know, India has a population of 1.4 billion. Let's say you have about a billion adults. Each adult needs not one dose, but two doses. Why is India's order so small? Not only so small, but also so late, because it's not October. It's actually January. It's January 2021 that the first orders are placed. Um, the, so India doesn't place its first vaccine orders until January of this January year. January of this year. And the explanation uh, is, I mean, not from the government, obviously, but from people who are trying to understand the government's perspective, is that none of these vaccines have been approved yet. The final approvals for Covishield only came in around December 2020, late in the year. In India, I mean, in the Indian trials. And so the Indian government couldn't, in any conscience, sort of take a bet with a huge amount of money on a vaccine that hadn't been approved. Now, I find that completely specious for a number of reasons. One is countries all around the world were taking those bets time and time again because they knew the upside to getting a vaccine approved uh, is far greater than the downside of laying out little money in advance and placing an order. Um, you know, by November, certainly, it looked as if Covishield, the AstraZeneca candidate, would find approval. It was just a question of, you know, would something go disastrously wrong in the last month of trials? It didn't. So even by November, they could have taken that bet. And then finally, yes, this this key question of sort of what happened in the decision-making process that India ordered, you know, 16, 17 million odd doses of vaccines in January, even in February, the second order million. Uh, from serum for Covishield vaccines, it was an order of 10 million, as late as February 2021. Um, and so the only thing I can figure out, or the only thing I can speculate about, is that India somehow genuinely thought, um, or the decision makers genuinely believed, um, in, in the face of all countervailing evidence, that there was no second wave coming, or that even if it came, it would be a sort of light second wave of, of the kind that we had seen the first one. You know, um, many people were speculating. There was all sorts of rife um, rumor about the fact that Indians have higher immunity or that, you know, uh, maybe so many people had been exposed to COVID already that some kind of herd immunity had been built up. Um, you know, and this was, you know, we, people were genuinely puzzled about the lightness of the first wave. And I think uh, a lot of Kool-Aid was drunk at some of these decision-making meetings. Uh, which resulted in these really paltry sort of first orders for vaccines. It wasn't until March 2021 that India placed 100 million doses, uh, an order of 100 million doses of Covishield. So March 2021, they start to make these big bulk purchases. But India also does something else, which is it starts to move to curb exports of vaccines that it is providing to other countries, right? So I think one of the questions a lot of Indians are asking is, why was the country exporting vaccines in the first place when it clearly didn't have enough for its own population? And to if this was a kind of soft power diplomatic move, to what extent can the government of India take credit for these exports if this was just Serum Institute providing doses under commercial or COVAX obligations it already had? Well, there's, I think, three different kinds of exports that we can we can break this down into. One is the Indian government engaged in what we call vaccine diplomacy, um, you know, uh, sending vaccines out as a gesture of goodwill um, to countries that obviously are sort of too poor or small to manufacture them themselves. The second is serums, doses, its obligations that it has to send out under COVAX. Um, which, uh, as, as, as far as my last memory of the statistic goes, Gabby told me about 29 million doses have gone out under that. The third is doses that Serum is sending out under its own commercial contracts with other governments or companies or entities, right? So to give you one example, we don't know what the original AstraZeneca Serum contract says about whether Serum is going to supply the countries of Europe and the UK and the US. You know, uh, AstraZeneca has manufacturing plants in all of these territories. Uh, it would be reasonable to assume that those plants would supply the West. Um, and yet in March 2021, when the UK temporarily ran short of doses over here of the AstraZeneca vaccine, we know that 5 million doses left India and went to the UK. Uh, we don't know whether Serum was always supposed to supply those as a stopgap. We don't know if AstraZeneca leaned on Serum 
We don't know if it was in the original contract that, you know, Serum would have to fill gaps in AstraZeneca's production schedule for the West. We don't know any of these things. Um, and of course, you know, Serum by itself is completely free to cut deals with other countries and to supply them vaccines. Um, this is something that, again, I think India didn't think, think through. And I'm not quite sure as yet how to process that, uh, because obviously we've seen in the West uh, countries such as the U.S. sort of imposing export rest restrictions quite early, you know, uh, making sure that vital supplies or even vaccines would not leave the country until the population's needs are taken care of. We see that as a restrictive um, practice, you know, particularly in the point of an emergency. We see it as a, 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 an example of the U.S. government hoarding these essentials. Um, so I don't know whether to uh, to praise the Indian government's restraint in not doing that initially, um, or whether to sort of criticize them for the fact that they didn't think this through the way other, you know, quite pragmatic governments clearly seem to have done. Um, so I'm a little bit torn about that. But but yes, I mean, there's, you know, there's 66 million odd doses of um, serum made vaccines out there in the world that could potentially, that's, it's, it's one month supply. Serum today makes 70 million doses a month. So it's a whole month's worth of supplies that India is already exporting. So all of this is playing out in real time. The second wave is gathering strength. Serum, as you document, is making uh, repeated uh, pleas with the government of India for more funds to expand its production. Your reporting shows that Serum had already been receiving hundreds of millions of dollars from the government of India, as well as other governments and other development agencies. As many of these contracts are secret, so we, we don't actually know. What do we know about Serum's motivations during this period, right? Uh, how much more money did they need if they were already getting this influx of funds uh, elsewhere and, and, and turning a profit, as their CEO had claimed? Yeah, it's difficult to tell. I mean, um, you know, Adar Poonawala has said time and time again uh, through 2020 and then even this year that over the course of last year, he invested $800 million in scaling up to meet COVID vaccines. Now, of that, we know $300 million has come from the COVAX facility, uh, the Gates Foundation and Gavi. Um, he said he invested between 200 and 250. I can't remember the details, but something on that order, uh, 200, 250 million dollars. So that still leaves another 250 dollars million dollars accounted for. Maybe it was advance payments from some governments or companies on something. We're not sure. Uh, but you know, what, one of the things that I kept wondering is, well, if you start, everybody's starting from zero in terms of capacity to manufacture COVID vaccines. Nobody's ever done this before. Nobody has a line ready to go. So he started building this out, I assume, you know, around May or June last year. Um, by April this year, he said he was at 70 million doses a month, which is significant. It's still sort of close to, you know, it's a lot. But I was, I always wondered, I mean, how much does it cost to build one of these lines? I mean, how much does it cost to add X number of doses per month to your capacity. So I went around asking people in the vaccine industry and the drug industry sort of what this costs. And all of the, you know, all of the figures I got were far, far, far less than that 800 million figure. You know, one guy told me that, you know, a, a recent line that had been set up in Norway to manufacture 45 million doses a month cost about $45 million. Um, and obviously that was going to be cheaper in India where land and labor and so on are quite quite inexpensive. Um, I think the most I heard, the highest kind of estimate I heard to set up a line manufacturing 100 million doses a month was around in the, in the region of $200 million, something like that. Um, so Adar, by his own admission, has four times that. Now, it is possible that he had the money, but he couldn't set up a much bigger capacity of production because supplies on the market were so limited. You look at things like bioreactors and bioreactor bags. You look at filters, you look like you look at culture mediums, you know, all of these things, there's limited supplies out there. Obviously the US companies have a head start. Um, so it's it's eminently possible that the market for all of this was cornered back then in 2020. Sure. And yet, even as late as March 2021, Punawala is claiming that the, one of the real problems is not 
um, his, you know, uh, his ability to expand, but just the fact that he doesn't have money. For it. And he goes back once again to the Indian government, you know, demanding a much bigger payment. And India eventually kicks in $400 million or so um, as an advance payment on a huge order of vaccines. So it really does beg the question. I mean, if he had $800 million last year, clearly he hasn't spent all of that to ramp up to a capacity of 70 million doses a month. Um, he's still asking for hundreds of millions of dollars in March. Where's this money going? Why don't we know more? And we should, I think, in this particular case. I realize Serum is a privately held company, um, but there are sort of public crises and emergencies where I think the public has a right to know sort of what is happening in a slightly more transparent way um, as compared to normal times, and yet we don't know that with other. And so he is, you know, potentially right now sitting on at least $1.2 billion of money, some of which has been invested already, um, the rest of which we don't know what he plans to do with. I forgot to mention one part of the story, which was uh, somewhat surprising, is uh, just a couple of weeks ago, he flies to the United Kingdom and seeks refuge there for a little bit. Uh, he's getting a lot of attention, a lot of harassment, he claims, from people who, who, who want to see you know, their vaccines and there's a shortage. Um, but he also announces new investments in the United Kingdom. What do we know about uh, what he's doing elsewhere? Very little. I mean, I think the investment in the UK is not for a manufacturing plant. I did manage to find that out. So it was about two hundred million pounds worth, and it was going to be there's going to be a sales office and some R and D. Uh, but I don't think it's a kind of center where he can start manufacturing vaccines for the Western world. Um, so it it seemed to be that he, I mean, it seemed to be a combination of things. One is that he really seemed at that time to be on some kind of huge press campaign. He was talking to uh, the Financial Times and the Times of London and the New York Times. He gave these interviews, not long, not extensive, but he clearly wanted to get his view of the situation out there and get ahead of the bad press that has been coming to him, uh, which is that he just hasn't managed to scale up. Uh, the second thing he said in the Times interview, which was interesting, was that he was getting a lot of um, semi-threatening phone calls from industrialists and chief ministers of states. I can completely understand that. I, I'm sure that's happening. We know what India is like. Um, and, you know, look, I can understand this is a very difficult situation for him. And it's sort of unfair, um, you know, on the part of India, on the part of AstraZeneca, on the part of COVAX and Gavi. And it's sort of unfair that all of these responsibilities have devolved onto this one company, um, you know, to supply essentially sort of maybe a third of the world or half the, you know, quarter of the world. Um, but having said that, you know, even in the midst of that unfairness, it looks like he's managed to make some not very good or confusing decisions. <laughs> Diplomatically put, Samant, uh, coming back to the present moment, I want to ask you about where India's vaccine rollout stands today, right? So we know that the central government has provided vaccines for frontline workers, for healthcare workers for people over the age of 45. What happens to those between the ages of 18 and 45? What are the center's obligations and what are the states supposed to be doing? Well, so right now, it, there's sort of a tripartite comp competition for vaccines that are produced. You know, the, the serum and Bharat Biotech will both supply doses to the central government. Um, they will supply doses to, to state governments at a slightly higher price and they will supply doses to private hospitals at a price that is even above that. Um, and, and so, you know, these three entities essentially find themselves competing against each other for the limited supply of vaccines. Not an ideal situation. Um, to compound that, it obviously, you know, there is an incentive system set up over here um, for these companies to sell preferentially to private hospitals because they pay top dollar. They're getting the highest They're price. They're getting the highest price. And then, you know, for private hospitals themselves, the sky is the limit. I mean, I've already started hearing stories about private hospitals um, administering doses of COVID shield for twenty bucks, twenty dollars a pop. You know, thousand two hundred rupees or thousand four hundred rupees. That makes it one of the most expensive vaccines in the world for COVID. Um, and uh, and 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 you know, this is only likely to sort of exacerbate as supply shortages continue. Um, the other thing that happened today that we should talk about is. Uh, the government, there's a government panel 
we don't know what panel, has put out an advisory that says, you know, the ideal time to take between two jabs of Covishield is now 12 to 16 weeks. And also that if you've had COVID at all, you should wait six months before you get vaccinated. Um, I, I don't, we don't know the data or the tests or the studies that these conclusions are based on at all. Um, the six month uh, metric in particular, I haven't heard about in any other country in the world. Um, in the UK, you know, AstraZeneca has been administered with a 12 week uh, margin, but they've extended this now in India to 16 weeks. This is clearly a way to manage these problems of supply and to make sure that demand is low. Um, so that so that's the other sort of problem. Uh, and then and then the final problem comes in terms of delivery, how to deliver the vaccine to the people who need it. Uh, there is an app, as with everything in the Modi administration, there is an app. The app crashes a lot. It's buggy. It has to be hacked in, in strange ways. And then when you get on it, there are never any slots on there, so you can't book a vaccine appointment. And, um, you know, for all his... Um, his digital India drive, we have to remember that there are millions, hundreds of millions of people in India who will not be able to download an app or know what to do with it. Um, and and so, you know, rather than going out into the population to ensure that every single person is vaccinated, the government is setting up the situation where it's trusting that the population will pour across its doorstep in an orderly fashion to get their shots. And India is not that kind of country. Um, you know, even in the cities, I think vaccine hesitancy is somewhat high. Certainly, um, knowledge about vaccines and why it's important to get immunized is is not high at all. I mean, a lot of people think that it's an option or that it's something that only has to do with your health. And this question of, of the vaccine as a public benefit, you get vaccinated so as you don't infect anybody else. That fact, that concept is quite frail, I think. Um, and, and you know, as I said, once you move out of the cities into the villages, that only becomes more extreme. So the communication has been shoddy. The messaging has been insufficient. Uh, this app sits at the center of it. And, you know, given the fact that India at one point conducted this extremely painstaking, thorough pulse polio campaign to immunize children against polio, um, you know, literally door to door, uh, working with the village self-help groups, uh, making sure that nobody was missed, because if anybody was missed, that means um, there would be an outbreak or the virus could spread. You know, given that India has that kind of experience, it's sort of shocking to see uh, see them roll back or abandon all of that expertise and pin their hopes on an app. So, so there's one piece of this that you didn't talk about, and I want to ask you about this, which is the uh the importation of, of of foreign vaccines, right? So India has really focused on quote unquote domestic vaccines from Serum and from Bharat Biotech, uh, but we now know they've given approval for the Sputnik vaccine. There are talks underway. We understand with both Pfizer and J and J, presumably others as well. Um, but the center, in what I think is a somewhat an unusual move, has basically said if the states want to import vaccines, they can do so, which sets up potentially a, a, a kind of a very competitive high stakes game where individual states are competing against one another to try to get those vaccines, which reminds me of what U.S. states were doing a year or so ago when, you know, New York was trying to get masks and Connecticut would swoop in and the federal government would come in and take it for both of them. And so so what's going on on the, on, on the foreign vaccine front? Well, I mean, I think... It's... So in, in one way, some of this, not all of this, but some of this discussion is moot um, in the sense that there's not that many foreign vaccines out there to buy yet. Um, you know, between sort of America's uh, America's own sort of vaccine nationalism, not wanting to release doses um, until sort of its vac population is fully vaccinated. I mean, we're really at a stage now where Pfizer's, I think Pfizer's vaccine was appro approved for 12 to 15 year olds in the US. Um, at, while at the same time, there are, vulnerable and healthcare workers um, in other countries around the world who've not been vaccinated. So there's a distinct inequity over here that the U.S. government has to address in some way. So so there's not that many vaccines out there to buy. Uh, the ones that will be there, you're right. I mean, what happens is this sets up the, it, it perfectly sets up the ground for a sort of bidding where states with deep pockets will go out there 
and try to get as many doses as possible for themselves ahead of states with, you know, not that much money. Um, so we can perfectly, you know, it's easy to imagine a situation where a Maharashtra or a Tamil Nadu has that kind of buying power. Um, and where the revenues will come from. I mean, this is, you know, the debates around the distribution of tax revenue in India uh, and on how the finance commissions sort of, uh, you know, distribute money uh, have been quite energetic for a while now, uh, to say the least. And I think this is something that's only going to add to that debate. I mean, if states are expected to go out into the international market to buy their vaccines to protect their populations, there's going to be a real sort of thinking about, uh, you know, why that much money should be sent away to the federal to the central government in the first place, um, if it's not being used to sort of do the kind of international buying that the center is always supposed to do. Uh, this is, it's, it's a very sort of unusual situation. And I, I don't know what precedent there is for it, but I do know, for example, of new finance minister of Tamil Nadu. Um, is is somebody who thinks heavily about this kind of stuff, about how states should distribute revenue among themselves and what states should do to safeguard more of their tax revenues for themselves. So uh, you, you talked about the fact that, look, even if these contracts are signed with a Pfizer or a Moderna, whoever, uh, it's not like there's a lot of excess supply at the moment, right? There's a lot of demand, not a lot of supply, uh, one of the things the Biden administration has done in recent days in a pretty stunning reversal was to indicate support for a measure at the World Trade Organization to suspend intellectual property rights on COVID-19 vaccines in order to make sure that poor countries could vaccinate their citizens. Um, you had a piece in courts where you write that, you know, while this might be a welcome move, it's really just the first step in a pretty long process could you describe for us what needs to happen for this waiver to actually improve vaccine availability on the ground in a country like India? Yeah. Um, so, so the Biden administration's move, while bold and unprecedented, is sort of um, is as of now largely symbolic. What has to happen is for the rest of the WTO, and this has to be a unanimous decision, which is difficult enough to obtain under normal circumstances. But the rest of the WTO, every all the members have to agree to the precise nature of this waiver on intellectual property. Uh, and that includes sort of, you know, what kinds of patents will be waived? Um, you know, will underlying technologies have their patents waived as well? Or is it just the IP of the vaccine itself? Um, what kind of payments will be set up? You know, who ensures that people gets paid? So all of this comes into play. Um, and I should just mention on that, Europe has made it stand pretty clear, which is that they continue to oppose a waiver, right? So all, already out of the gate, you have a big problem. Right. And, and you know, and the WTO is not, as far as I could see, I mean, there were people in the uh, who are familiar with the process talking about the fact that even negotiating all of this stuff could take as late as November or December. And, 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 so, and once that happens, there's a separate issue, which is, so the, patent, the IP waiver is, you can think of it as a recipe. It's like a recipe card for the vaccine. Uh, but the recipe is quite complicated. Um, and so a head chef has to go down to the kitchens in these various countries and train the sous chefs in making this dish on their own. So there has to be what is called in the industry as a tech transfer and a knowledge transfer. And companies are not obligated to do that. You know, Pfizer can sort of, you know, Pfizer has to sit back and allow these IP waivers to happen if the WTO votes on it. But Pfizer is not obligated to go out there and train these people to do uh, the kind of science that needs to be done. And so there has to be a further process where the U.S. government leans on these companies um, to cooperate with that stage of the process as well. Right. So that happens. So, you know, Pfizer, all these other companies send people out. Uh, to countries like India, where there is already some kind of manufacturing capacity, and there is some transfer of knowledge and technology, there will need to be new equipment, new supplies brought in, because these lines are not manufactured the same way as the Covishield lines. And so you'll need, um, you'll need more stuff, you'll need more money. So there has to be some fundraising for that. And then, you know, I don't know how long this is going to take. Uh, people who are, you know, ardent champions of IP, insist that it will take, you know, months and years uh, 
for um, for these knowledge transfers to actually have an effect. People in India tell me something completely different. They say they could do it in a matter of three months. Uh, we, they could have something up and running. I don't know. It's It's difficult to say. But regardless of anything, it doesn't seem possible, I think, even if we start from today and run through the timeline of events, it doesn't seem possible for a factory in India to be manufacturing a version of a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, you know, by mid-2022. At the earliest, I'd say. It might be later. Now, it's useful in the medium term or the long term because clearly this disease is not going to go away. There are still going to be variants floating around. Um, we may need boosters or shots on a regular basis. Um, the EU is already planning and has, I think, placed an order for, uh, you know, millions of doses to be delivered in 2023. So that's two years out. So everybody's thinking about this long term. And undoubtedly, if the IT waiver goes through, it will help avoid the kind of crisis that India has now. It will have, help avoid that kind of crisis in 2022 or 2023. But I don't think the IP waivers will do anything to um, help the situation in 2021. And what really needs to happen from the point of view of the Biden administration is for the government to not just follow through with that in parallel, but also lean on, you know, first of all, lift its curbs on exports, um, which, which kick in under the Defense Production Act so that supplies can be you know, purchased on the open market, but also release, for example, its surplus doses of AstraZeneca vaccine, which I believe has not even been approved in the U.S. yet. Um, it is, you know, yeah, the FDA hasn't approved it for domestic use. Yeah. Right. So release those to go into the uh, international market. Um, allow Pfizer and Moderna to sort of divert some of their um, surplus U.S. supply, um, again, to countries like India. And, and finally, also to recognize that the U.S. itself has to now start thinking about uh, doing some kind of triage on the international uh, landscape where, you know, 12 to 15 year olds in the U.S. are not as vulnerable as um, healthcare workers in Africa or in Asia. And so maybe it is for the global good that these doses go there first rather than come to teenagers in, in, in America. Um, so I think that's that's sort of the other uh, aspect of it. And I, I, th I think r until now, the Biden administration ha and even the Trump administration last year has done the relatively easy thing, which is to kick up money um, for COVAX, for example. Uh, but I think the hard decisions haven't been made yet. So, so I'm, I want to kind of bring this conversation to an end by asking you to sort of step back. You know, you took up a new position at Quartz. Uh, to monitor the future of capitalism, right? Which is a very, very, very big subject. Uh, I'm curious what this entire episode and this reporting you've done has taught you about the business of vaccines, right? You had a piece published yesterday where you argue that taxpayers of many countries are paying not once, but twice for their own vaccines. Uh, how so? Well, so when I first started reporting on vaccines last April, March or April, um, you know, even back then I was struck by the fact that all of these vaccine candidates that seemed promising back then, you know, so much of the basic research on that, basic science, stretching back decades in Europe and in the UK and in uh, America, all of, all of this or so much of this research had been funded by taxpayers, by governments, by government grants, sometimes by philanthropies sometimes by coalitions like uh, CEPI, which includes government money in its, uh, in its uh, grants. So all of this had been funded patiently at points where, you know, they were high risk ventures. Uh, nobody knew if they would pay off. And all of them came to fruition at about the right time for this COVID vaccine to be developed on the basis of them. Uh, so, that, so that takes us until March 2020. And then after that, governments started kicking in further money to companies to enhance their manufacturing capacity, placing advanced orders, essentially de-risking the COVID vaccine um, enterprise so that companies would be encouraged to, uh, to take on the responsibility of manufacturing one should a vaccine ever be approved. So more money. And then, you know, in the case of Moderna is actually sort of an interesting case because um, Moderna is based on three separate uh, and crucial technolo technological breakthroughs. Uh, all three have been funded. 
in large part by um, the US government or by uh, German government. And in one of these three cases, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, actually owns the patent on the technology, on this little protein that um, helps evoke an immune response. Um, so Moderna and other, com uh, other companies that are using mRNA technology, they are supposed to be licensing this patent from the US government, from the NIH, but Moderna doesn't pay the NIH a license for reasons unknown. Pfizer apparently does, Moderna doesn't. And then finally, after all of this is done, the US government goes back to these companies and buys the vaccines at between $15 and $20 a pop um, in the understanding that once this crucial phase of the pandemic is passed, companies will be free to raise their prices um, you know, and, and be commercial again in their pricing, as one of the executives of these companies put it. And so all of this seems to me that the taxpayer has sort of paid over the years for the research, had pay, has paid these companies to enhance their capacity, um, is sort of refraining from taking license fees that should be accruing to the government and is then paying the government to enhance the, uh, and is then paying the company to buy these vaccines and enhance their bottom lines. And so it struck me as a perfect example of something that people in the drug industry have been talking about for a long time, which is this conversion of public subsidy to private profit. Uh, and it's been difficult to quantify in the past just because drug development is complicated and long. But in this particular case, there's been so much that's been done um, on a public stage, quite transparently, in terms of grant announcements and so forth, that it's, you know, a couple of academics have actually worked out some of the, you know, the funding uh, portions for one vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine. And they found that up to 99% of all research funds that led to the development of the AstraZeneca vaccine came from public funds, from public money, taxpayer money. And so, uh, you know, it's, it seems to me, uh, you know, it's a great time to get into the future of capitalism, beat because it seems like this is really what the future of capitalism ought to be trying to fix, um, uh, the conversion of public subsidy into private profit. My guest on the program this week is Salman Subramaniam. He is a senior reporter at Quartz covering the future of capitalism. His reporting on the Indian vaccine rollout has been a central reading. Salman, we know you have a lot of reporting to do. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks, Milan. So glad. Grant the Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. This podcast is an HT Smartcast original and is available on htsmartcast.com, India's fastest growing podcasting producing platform. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we referenced on this week's episode, visit our website, granthamasha.com. Production assistance comes from Jonathan Kay, Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Cliff Jayapranada is our executive producer. Thanks for listening and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.